Let's take a look at pathogen group number nine. We were starting out with a big statement. The diarrhea disease is the world's number one cause of death. That will be from infectious diseases. So um, the estimation is it's about 5 million deaths per year, and mostly among children and it, of diarrhea, and then end up dying from dehydration. Um, here are some of the offenders uh, for gastrointestinal infections. We have uh, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella, and E. coli 0157H7. And then also here you see the rate per 100,000 of the population in various states are listed right here. So California right down here, um, with apparently a lot of Campylobacter infections. Um, let's take a look at two different types of diarrhea. One, you could have diarrhea from toxigenic bacteria. Um, that means that the bacteria are producing some toxin and it irritates, so we have a bit here, uh, the bacteria producing toxin, it irritates your gastrointestinal tract and you end up with diarrhea. Here in the invasive type, the bacteria, they are invading the tissue. They're breaking through your lining right here, the epithelium, and then they cause ulceration and they break blood vessels and you may have bleeding and worst case scenario, uh, they're breaking all the way through the um, intestinal walls and then you have big abdominal bleeding and a big problem. An example here for invasive diarrhea would be um, the diarrhea caused by E. coli 0157H7. That's often referred to as bloody diarrhea. So let's move on to Brucella arbortis. That's our first pathogen in this group right here. Um, we have other species here too, but uh, so Brucella arbortis, the cause of brucellosis. That's the name of the disease. It's a tiny gram-negative bacillus, aerobic, non-motel, as animal, animal reservoirs of all things, bison, for example, uh, the transmission by direct contact, ingestion, airborne, or even vaccine accidents. So here we have the buffalo as a reservoir for brucellosis. Uh, it can be acute or chronic. It is a systemic disease, and the symptoms are fever, sweats, fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, headache, arthralgia, your joints are hurting. So buffalo being a reservoir. The fever of brucellosis is called an undulating fever because it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. So it's undulating, it's going up and down. <clears throat> We're moving on to a big offender, and that's the genus Salmonella. In this genus, we have over 2,400 subtypes or serovars. So let's take a look at the profile first. We have a gram-negative bacillus right here with peritrichus flagella. It's facultative anaerobic, and it's considered to be one species. And so here we have Salmonella enterica, but then we have these many subtypes or serovars of the genus Salmonella. So here, uh, the technically correct nomenclature for the genus Salmonella, here for two different serovars of the Salmonella enterica. So here's Salmonella enterica, and the serovar is typhi. The next one, Salmonella enterica, serovar enteritidis, etc. And then you have your thousands of different serovars. The genus Salmonella has both human and animal reservoirs. There's much drug resistance, so antibiotic resistance, that is, and that is because of uh, all the antibiotic, antibiotics used in animal feed. Let's take a look at Salmonella typhi. So that is the serovar typhi, and this one causes typhoid fever. The uh, profiles here, it's a human reservoir, um, usually the infection is through fetal contamination of food and water. It's always systemic, and the symptoms include fever, headache, malaise, anorexia, dry cough. Um, there's a story about Typhoid Mary, who was a restaurant worker who refused to wash her hands after using the bathroom. And um, she was uh, blamed, and it's probably true that uh, she spread typhoid fever to many, many customers of that restaurant. And so eventually they tracked her down, and so she was then labeled as Typhoid Mary. And sometimes in the news these days you hear when people um, don't want to wash their hands or they're not careful and they're starting to spread disease and they're being labeled as, you know, you're like a Typhoid Mary. So that sort of uh, has become sort of a standing term, basically. Now let's take a look at how typhoid becomes systemic. So here you have your typhoid bacilli. 
and they're entering here your uh, the intestinal villi and in the intestinal villi for absorption purposes of course you have blood vessels that will carry whatever you've absorbed the product of your digestion uh, whatever you want to absorb you want to carry it to the cells that need the um, the nutrients and so as the typhoid bacilli enter in here then they enter the blood vessel right here and of course uh, then they will be carried to all sorts of places in your body and that's how typhoid becomes systemic here's an image showing you the damage by typhoid to the small intestine we can see uh, perforation ulcers and uh, none of this is good of course and it causes pain too so here let's move on to salmonella and teratitis um, the other some other serovars here we're looking at intestinal salmonellosis there's usually animal sources um, and it's due to ingestion of meat milk poultry eggs uh, basically chicken take a lot of the blame salmonella often is found on the surface of eggs also in poultry in general <clears throat> reptiles and other pets also have a pretty bad reputation especially uh, like iguanas and you know typical reptile kind of animals and then the rodent feces, and then there's also human-to-human -human transmission. And you can see over here the paratrichus flagella of the salmonella. Um, intestinal salmonellosis leads to the following symptoms, diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, sometimes vomiting. It may become systemic, and in 10 to 20% of the cases it may result in arthritis. So here the transmission of salmonella and teratitis. And here you have many modes at which you might end up getting infected um, milk um, especially poultry and eggs those are sort of the big offenders egg products only if this would be including um, the use of raw eggs so let's say you make some sort of a custard and it calls for raw eggs that you are beating and mixing in with uh, the rest of your filling that whatever you're making here pie filling or something and now uh, the salmonella was let's say on the surface of the eggs and somehow got a little bit got into the um into your custard filling and then uh, eating that of course it could, could make you sick so that could be ingested the one good thing about salmonella is that it's very heat sensitive so anytime you're heating something up let's say you're boiling your eggs you don't have to worry about um, salmonella anymore salmonella however is not easily destroyed even by your uh, stomach acidity and that makes it a tough um, pathogen the incubation period here is listed as 12 to 24 hours with the salmonella infection in this poor guy. Salmonella can also be found in some places that might surprise you. Here's an example of unpasteurized orange juice, and that is because the oranges, um, sometimes on the surface, they can carry the salmonella. And uh, when you're making orange juice and don't pasteurize it, the oranges are being squeezed out the juice is squeezed out by smashing the whole orange and so something that was on the surface on the outside of the orange could then get into the some the orange juice if it's not pasteurized it will stay there so let's take a look at the um, comparison of the salmonella typhi uh, versus uh, enteritis and here we have the uh, reservoir and typhi is humans and enteritis the reservoirs many kinds of animals could also be human and um, uh, salmonella typhi is systemic enteritis usually intestinal but could maybe go systemic typhi usually leads to constipation in some people diarrhea but usually constipation and enteritis leads to diarrhea in people uh, this is kind of an older chart uh, showing you case numbers of typhoid versus all other salmonelloses and so here the typhoid uh, in purple cases of typhoid fever they have been on a steady decline but other salmonellosis in exchange have been on a steady rise so um well this chart ends here in 1990 so that's kind of some time ago but recently salmonella hasn't caused that big of a problem so it's you're sort of off the radar kind of right now um, next pathogen is um, shigella dysenteriae and that's the cause of shigellosis. And this is a gram negative bacillus, no motility. Um, it's transmitted to fecal contamination, contamination of food or water, causes damage to the intestinal walls, and the symptoms here are diarrhea, fever, nausea, and cramps. Here's how shigella enters the intestinal cell. 
So she will not enter in, in here, it's this round thing right there. And then um, she will not, is now entering this endothelial cell. Then um, it will multiply inside of the cell. So you see we have three now here. And then it in, starts invading neighboring cells. And eventually it just kills the intestinal cells. And then you have um, maybe an abscess forming. Uh, due to the immune system getting involved, you could also have some ulceration. Next up here, Vibrio cholerae, the cause of much feared cholera. There have been many outbreaks over the centuries. It's a very feared um, infectious disease because the many children die from massive dehydration. It just gives you massive um, diarrhea. And so especially in times when people were drawing their water from common wells. Um, there were outbreaks in England that got famous uh, because John Snow, he was doing some uh, early epidemiological research, if you will, and he tracked down um, a cholera outbreak to a specific well in London, and uh, that's sort of a famous story. But let's take a look at the pathogen here. Uh, we have a curved, um, it's called comma shape. You can see it literally, this is this comma shape right here in this, um, these bacteria. Curved gram negative bacillus, so a rod, with a single polar flagellum right here. You can see this very nicely curved rod, single polar flagellum down here. And, um, the transmission is by fecal or contamination of food or water. Uh, the effect of the cholera toxin is shown here. And um, cholera toxin causes massive diarrhea, also vomiting, and a lot of children die usually from dehydration. Uh, the diarrhea is so bad, people call it rice water stool. So that's it's as um, the diarrhea is so watery that it just uh, takes out all of your electrolytes, and it causes just a uh, you know massive dehydration. So and um, it's as thin, basically, as when you're washing rice and you just have a little bit of turbidity to the water. So that's how massive the, the diarrhea is. So here's how the toxin works. So we have the Vibrio cholerae, and the toxin is binding here to a receptor. And it happens to increase the adenylate cyclase activity. So it's a second messenger pathway that activates adenylate cyclase activity. And once the cyclic AMP is present, and that's the result of the adenylate cyclase activity, then you typically open ion channels. And this can lead to the loss of massive amounts of ions. And with the ions goes the water, and that's where you get the diarrhea from, and the dehydration, and the massive loss of electrolytes. Campylobacter jejuni. This one is a gram negative spiral bacterium with polar flagella. It's not the best picture here, but you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, it's the most common cause of human foodborne gastroenteritis in, in the world. It's associated with Guillain Barr syndrome, and that involves autoimmune destruction of myelin sheets. Um, so the 30 to 40 percent of uh, Goulain Barr syndrome are associated with Campylobacter infection. Transmission is uh, ingestion of contaminated food, water, or milk, or contact with pets, wild animals. I'm not sure here, infants, I guess, infected infants it is. And here we have a picture of the uh, Campylobacter jejuni on the intestinal wall. So you can see the, all the bacteria right here, and it would cause um, then diarrhea. And here is the profile of Listeria monocytogenes. We have a gram-positive bacillus, facultative anaerobic, with motility. It's often found on unpasteurized dairy products, able to grow in the refrigerator. That makes it sound pretty dangerous. It uh, the, can cause systemic disease. Uh, the symptoms can range from mild to fatal, uh, most severe in the very young and in the very old, so neonates and elderly people. And worst case scenario, it will lead to meningitis or stillbirth. On food labels, here's a cheese labeling. What you want to look for is uh, that uh, it's pasteurized, pasteurized milk. Pasteurization prevents the spread of listeria. So now let's move on to the last one, and that is rotavirus. Rotavirus is really widespread. It is the number one cause of infant diarrhea worldwide. The virus has double-stranded RNA as genetic material, no envelope. The transmission is through the fecal route, and it kills almost a million infants per year, mainly in developing countries. We do have a few deaths in industrialized nations, but most children will have rotavirus diarrhea before age five. 
Um, there was a vaccine, but it was recalled. Um, but anytime you have a kid with uh, diarrhea, my first guess would be rotavirus is the culprit.